In the episode you're about to watch, we had some major technical issues. You'll notice glitches and lags, and there's a chunk near the middle where we cut out a nine minute portion because it was very difficult to discern what all three parties were saying. Thank you so much for bearing with us through these technical issues. This is Just Asking Questions, a show for inquiring minds on reason. Is the future of the GOP more libertarian? more nationalist or somehow both just asking questions i'm zach weissmuller senior producer joined by my co-host liz wolf reason associate editor and author of the daily reason roundup and joining us today is vivek ramaswamy entrepreneur author and former presidential candidate he's been making a hard pitch for what he's called the Libertarian Nationalist Alliance for the past several months. I ran into him at the Libertarian National Convention where he was trying to convince libertarians to vote Republican this year. Saw lots of him at the Republican National Convention where he was trying to convince MAGA to be more libertarian. Uh, and reason Stephanie Slade saw him make his case for so-called national libertarianism at, the, at NatCon, the National Conservative Conference also attended by vice presidential candidate J.D. Vance, who has a slightly different vision for the conservative movement. We're going to talk a little bit about the differences in those, vision, in those visions in detail today. But Vivek, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, it's good to see you guys. And I, one of the things I love about conversations like this one is we can you know, assume an audience that has some basic knowledge of the contours so we can dig past the surface a little bit, which I appreciate and enjoy doing. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so first, to start us off, I wanted to roll a clip of your speech at the RNC and then roll right after that a clip of J.D. Vance's speech, um, sure. you know, obviously picked as Trump's vice presidential candidate. Um, John, would you go ahead and play those? What does it mean to be a Republican in the year 2024? What does it mean to be an American in the year 2024? It means we believe in the ideals of 1776. It means we believe in merit, that you get ahead in this country, not on the color of your skin, but on the content of your character and your contributions. It means we believe in the rule of law. And I say this as the kid of legal immigrants to this country. That means your first act of entering this country cannot break the law. That is why we will seal the southern border on day one. Thank you. It means the people who we elect to run the government ought to be the ones who actually run the government, not unelected bureaucrats in the deep state. These are not black ideas or white ideas. They are not even Democrat ideas or Republican ideas. They are American ideas that we fought a revolution to secure. You know, one of the things that you hear people say sometimes is that America is an idea. And to be clear, America was indeed founded on brilliant ideas like the rule of law and religious liberty, things written into the fabric of our Constitution and our nation. But America is not just an idea. It is a group of people with a shared history and a common future. It is, in short, a nation. Now, it is part of that tradition, of course, that we welcome newcomers. But when we allow newcomers into our American family, we allow them on our terms. That's the way we preserve the continuity of this project from 250 years past to hopefully 250 years in the future. Do you think there's tension between the ideas expressed by you and then by J.D. Vance? Yes, I'll draw a couple of distinctions. I think is on the personal side, it's actually uh, particularly interesting because J.D. and I actually are good friends long before we each even knew of each other's politics. We grew mm -hmm. up, it turns out, about 15 minutes from each other, the place I was in kindergarten versus where he grew up. We knew each other only in law school, but we were two lone Cincinnatians in law school at Yale. And the first thing I'll say is one of the best things about him as a vice president is he is somebody who's in this I believe and I know for the right reasons. He is somebody who truly cares about saving this country. Do we have some differences in our worldview, even for the future of the America First movement? Yeah, of course we do. In fact, that's made our own personal relationship stronger. One of the things that's actually strengthened our relationship is we push each other a little bit on slightly differing visions 
of what the future of not only the Republican Party, but even the America First movement should be. Now, I gave this speech in NatCon, and I do think that this dialogue is important. We reject the historical neoliberal consensus for the same reasons. I think that it was too blithe with respect to believing that we would somehow use capitalism as a vector to spread democracy to places like China, that we were going to somehow export Big Macs and Happy Meals, and that would spread democracy in China. It hasn't worked out that way. To the contrary, we're now dependent on a foreign country that's our adversary for even our own military. Things like that don't make sense. I think we've been too blithe with respect to our approach on immigration. America's just an economic zone, but it's important to select expressly for immigrants who know something about the United States of America. So you could call that a civic nationalist worldview. That's the one that I share. That's very different, however, from a different view, one that's coherent that I respect but disagree with, that the policies of immigration or trade policy should be made with the objective of expressly protecting American manufacturers or workers from the effects of competition. I believe merit is our heritage. Excellence is our heritage as Americans. I do believe that people, you know, I think it's some have, some have said, made the claim that people won't fight for abstract ideals. I actually think that people would fight for abstract ideals. In fact, Americans are known for that. That's what our American Revolution was about. We fought for the founding of this nation based on those ideals. And so I believe the loss of this country and simply blithe neoliberal economics has lost that sense of civic identity, which is what I want to revive. But I think that there's a different basis for maybe rejecting that neoliberal fantasy of the past, which is more of a blood and soil revisionist American identity. And, and I do reject that. And I do think the more we're able to have that type of healthy, thoughtful dialogue on the right, and even on what I think of as the positive nationalist right, the stronger we're going to be as a country. And so we could go miles deeper into all of those points. But at a surface level, I think there are two competing worldviews for what the future of America first looks like. Yes. But if their view wins out specifically on things like tariffs and on immigration policy, you know, what will what will you do about it? Or, or you know, what what will that say about what the America first movement stands for? I mean, to, to me, that looks like the ascendant set of beliefs. So I, I, w I would uh, respectfully push back only because I have a basis to have some authority here in traveling the country over the last year, talking to the Republican primary base. And mm -hmm. here's my, my frank assessment of where we are. I think there are certain core principles that we definitively agree on. Okay, I think we definitively agree that the people we elect to run the government should be the ones running the government, not the unelected bureaucrats, as I said in the speech. We definitively agree, and here's a big one, that the first and sole moral duty of U.S. officials should be to U.S. citizens. That, that is just as a father figure owes his family his primary duty, the president of the United States or the elected leaders of the United States owe their primary duty to the citizens of the United States. And to be clear, this country has been governed in ways that have been inconsistent with that. That's Absolutely. resulted in a loss of civic, I mean, think about our foreign policy, think about other areas, where part of the reason I believe many Americans have lost their sense of allegiance to our nation is that our own national leaders have lost their allegiance to our own citizens. So those are deep areas of agreement. But one of the things that I see when I travel the country is, on one hand, you may have other thoughtful, well-spoken leaders that would come into a room of America First Patriots and say something like, we need to make more things in the United States of America. We need to make sure that our manufacturers are protected from the effects of other countries dumping their goods in. And we need to make sure Americans earn a proper wage and protect them from immigrants who are undercutting our jobs. And to your point, Liz, I'll admit, you could be in a room where you would get a lot of applause to that from a grassroots audience. But here's maybe the part that you may not have been privy to that I have mm -hmm. uh, a, deep, a deep connection to here is mm -hmm. if I'm showing up in that same room, right, and it's just on a blank slate, same people, same room, and say, you know what? We don't want to replace a, right, a left-wing nanny state with a right-wing nanny state. We want to dismantle the nanny state. We don't want to entrust regulatory agencies. Hey, but just by a show of hands, and I've done this countless times, just by a show of hands in this room, who believes we should reform the regulatory state and send the CFPB or the FTC or the three-letter agencies in Washington, D.C. to protect American workers and interests, or do we want to go in and actually dismantle those three-letter agencies? Shut it down or chance that I get in response to that. 
In this section, we cut a portion where Vivek was talking about how the America First movement is fractured in some ways and still in its nascency, trying to sort out questions internally. During this chunk, we played a clip of J.D. Vance, and Vivek then answered that, but it was very hard to tell what exactly his answer was, so we chose to excise a portion of that. And then we jump back in, and him and I are going back and forth a little bit. I, I I hear what you're saying, but I'm wondering whether you're being too soft on your allies, you know, being too soft on Trump and Vance. When I look at the America First movement, I see some things, like some of the things you're citing, you know, Trump's flip-flopping on the TikTok ban, where it is heartening. But I see also a movement that seems very animated by a sense of vengeance, a sense that the left has for so long seized our cultural and governmental institutions, and an idea that once conservatives are back in power that their enemies ought to be punished. How do you how do you react to that? Do you see the same thing that I'm seeing? Well, look, I think that there is a lot of anger, and I share that anger, if you think about the abuses I'm, of I'm power over the last several years. I don't want to punish the political is, opponents over it. So, so the open question, though, Liz, is I think that the question is how do we channel that anger to something productive, right? And I think that we miss the opportunity to change this country and to actually bring the right base of people along if we just dismiss the anger. So I'm not one of these people that just says, okay, don't be angry, move on. No, I actually, just as I would advise a kid or something, right? You're experiencing an emotion. Don't reject it, right? Acknowledge it, right? Acknowledge it fully. Feel it. But then let's separate that from the question of how you channel that to make sure that, you know, do you want to fight fire with fire or do you find that maybe water is more effective? It's a question of effectiveness. There are moments that demand fighting fire with fire. I think in Donald Trump's first term, certainly for much of that, they didn't leave him with much of an option other than that. You got an impeachment inquiry that was based on fraudulent pretenses. You have a lot of systematic government media coordination and not the people say he ran the government. Well, talking about the deep state in the, in the media industrial complex that created a lot of abuses of the federal police state, both while he was in and out of office. But the real question is, do we want to fight fire with fire when water can be far more effective? And you listen to a lot of things Donald Trump does say on a given day that doesn't get reported in the media. And I'll be very frank, you know, I, I'm vocal about about believing that this is the right direction. And, and, and he knows this from me as well is that success is our vengeance, is part of what he says now as well. Success is unifying. Excellence is unifying. We don't want to go after left-wing opponents using the police state. We want a police state that does not... We, we want a minimal police state, first of all, and one that merely enforces the laws as they exist on the books. I think we have way too many broad statutes in this country. Part of the problem is you got a weaponization of government you can only weaponize laws if the laws are written so broadly so as to be weaponized in the first place. Administrative agencies should not have the deference to be able to use laws to be able to go after political opponents for things that those laws were never conceived to do in the first place. So that's where I do think we need to be focused. I think that where I would be critical of, of many Republicans, Liz, is you know expanding, say, FISA 702. I think that you, and it wasn't a reauthorization, by the way, it was an expansion. I don't think you can at once say that you're against the weaponization of government while also voting for expanding the tools that government uses as a weapon, right? Those, those are two inconsistent things to say at the same time. But part of our job is people do need to be led, right? And part of what a leader does, I believe, is not just tell people what they want to hear, but tell people what they need to hear. And actually, much of our base is hungry for that. That little clip of you that you that you put up from social media of me speaking about we don't want to replace a left-wing nanny state with a right-wing nanny state, that was actually one of the state delegations that I was speaking to at the RNC, where I was projecting that we are going to have temptation. We're going to face this temptation. Which route do we want to take? And I'll come back to what I told you. Is forget what you see in the people who are deemed to be the, the leaders on TV of our movement. When you talk about the actual base of voters in the America First movement, I think there's a very, at minimum, open mind, and in my estimation, actually a favorable lean to the hard, minimalist vision of government that I bring to the table and that, that conservatives brought to the table for decades. I also want to say a word about history here, which is, which is kind of interesting here. If you trace the movement of this, it's quite popular amongst the America First Right, and I'm part of this, to rail against the neocons, right? the neoconservative vision of the past. Pause to remember what the neocon vision or the original neoconservative vision was. I think m what many of us mean is pointless foreign interventionism that doesn't advance American interests, things like the Iraq war, the Afghanistan war, where we've spent billions of dollars, trillions of dollars that haven't advanced American interests, that added to our national debt, that sacrificed American lives. That's what people think when they're railing against neocons. But actually, it's worth remembering the neoconservative term, even the proponents who 
called themselves in their own terms, neoconservative, rejected the older conservative vision of really dismantling the nanny state. The older conservative vision was about taking Lyndon B. Johnson's great society and throw it in the trash bit where I believe it belongs. And the neoconservative faction in, you were talking the 90s, the 2000s, accepted that there was some level of governmental presence that was here to stay and they weren't going to be antipathic to the same degree. So in some ways, the irony is that much of this now pro-patronage, national patronage camp or national protectionist camp in the, in the America First movement, while railing against neocons on the foreign policy, are actually in some ways just a successor of that neocon direction, whereas the national libertarian direction that I favor, or we call it national liberty or the civic nationalist direction that I favor as an alternative is actually about restoring the original conservative alternative to the neocons and rejecting neoconservatism in all of its terms. I'm glad that you brought up recent political history because I wanted to discuss the historical lessons of th this attempt that you're making right now to have a national libertarian alliance. There was something attempted like that in the 90s called paleo libertarianism. <laughs> um, it was, uh, you know, um, Pat Buchanan, Wyance, um, I was reading some of the reflections on that from Lou Rockwell, who was one of the architects of that. Murray Rothbard was also involved in it. Mm -hmm. uh, he said it seemed like a good deal at the time, a prominent TV personality fighting the political war against warfare and welfare. Sounds kind of familiar. The paleo conservatives were sound on local and states rights, but weren't too thrilled with the products of commercial society intended towards erroneous views on economics. Indeed, many of them cared nothing for systematics. The libertarians would take care of economics. The conservatives would take care of history and culture. Um, but in speech after speech, Pat, began, Pat Buchanan began to bring his opposition to free trade and his advocacy of protectionism to the forefront. He endorsed protectionism for a greater range of sectors than were already in place. In other words, he proposed expanding taxation regulation. Uh, he celebrated unemployment relief. And for him, America first, that grand old agenda of organized labor. And I will note that the head of the Teamsters just gave a speech at the RNC. Um, and then the kind of conclusion here is that thankfully the campaign ended but bolstered by his new credibility, Pat began to wield enormous influence on the right. This took one main form, turning people who should have known better against free markets, capitalism, and free anti-libertarian. So I'll say, Vivek, that that encapsulates a lot of my fears as to where this project could head. Um, is it going to be different this time? Yeah, so look, I mean, I, I, am, uh, I don't think this is a resuscitation of that. I think um, what I'm talking about, admittedly, here is something new, okay. right? Something that does not exist, but, but needs to exist. And I think whatever is necessary is always possible. I think there are some, it's worth knowing the historical context, though. I'm not an economic nationalist. I, I think that that's the wrong way to go. Not because I believe that the libertarian principles I espouse on principle are more important than the interests of American workers and manufacturers, but because I think the best way to serve American workers and manufacturers is actually by dismantling the regulatory state that has shackled them for so long. I think that we need leadership in the conservative movement that is brave and courageous enough to take Lyndon B. Johnson's great society and actually say, our top goal is to dismantle it. Go back to the project that Woodrow Wilson began, that metastasized with FDR's New Deal, that metastasized even further with LBJ's Great Society, to say that we're going to take that century-old project and relegate it to the dustbins of history where it belongs. Have we had that? No, I don't think we've had that. Not even through Pat Buchanan, certainly not through today, because I think there has been the magnetic tendency towards protectionism and economic nationalism that I do think is in conflict because it involves a statist force to be able to overcome what we initially thought motivated us, which was the effects of overexpansive statism. So what I'm talking about is something new altogether. I do think that they're the national part of national libertarian or the national liberty movement is important to me. And there, I think what I believe is missing in the pure libertarian, or at least modern version of pure libertarian view, is a prioritization on the importance of national identity, of civic pride in the country. I don't think dual citizenship should be a thing in the United States of America. I think that citizenship is about duty, that you pledge allegiance to one country, period. That's what it means to be a citizen of a nation. I don't believe in open borders. I believe that a nation without borders, in a very practical sense, is not a nation. So I believe in these levers of national identity. I don't think it makes sense for the United States' military. And today, the number one supplier of equipment, indirectly or directly, to the Navy, Air Force, and Army, 40% of the semiconductors that power equipment come from China. It doesn't make any sense, because if you're going to have a military, God forbid, 
I don't want a scenario of conflict, but it doesn't make any sense that if part of what you're doing is deterring conflict through strength for you to de- rely on that adversary. So that's those are examples of what put the national into national libertarian. I personally believe we require a civics test, right, of every immigrant to become a legal citizen of this country and a loyalty oath. Well, if we, if we require it of legal immigrants, I think we should require it of my own children and every one of our children when they turn 18 should be held to those same standards because it's worth having a citizenry that actually knows something about a nation and has civic commitments. So for me, that's the national in national libertarian. But I think that's something new. It hasn't existed, but I think that's what the moment demands. But it's in some sense, it's not new because it goes back to our founding. This is what I think our founding fathers were. They were libertarian in their policy outlook, but nationalist in their commitment to this new nation that was divine on civic ideals. And there's something lurking beneath the surface here that I think is worth calling to the fore. It's not only competing visions with respect to the regulatory state that exists. I think there's a deeper rift on our vision of American identity itself, right? What does it mean to be an American? I think that is an open question worth debating in the open. I'm not a blood and soil guy. I don't think the blood and soil view makes sense, actually, because then you have to pick a certain point in time saying, well, if you go too far back, that doesn't count. If you're too recent, it doesn't count either, but it's just sort of some sort of midpoint in between. No, it's just incoherent on its own terms. I think America is a nation founded on the ideals enshrined in the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution. Will people fight for those ideals? Yes, we did. In 1776, we did it again in 1860. That's who we are as Americans, is we're uniquely the country that is bound together by that common set of ideals. And if you adopt the blood and soil view as an alternative, that denies the possibility of American exceptionalism. Because every nation, in fact, other nations have much stronger claims on blood and soil bases for their heritage, Japan or Italy, or you could go straight down the list of other countries that have a much stronger genetic lineage, blood and soil basis for their own heritage and national identity. America's is far weaker as a younger country. The thing that America makes American exceptionalism possible is that we're not just a bunch of two-legged higher mammals walk in a geographic space that we end up calling a country. The thing that makes America unique, and I do believe in American exceptionalism, is that we are bound by ideals and our ability to believe in ideals is actually what what distinguishes human beings from all other animals, is that we can believe in ideals greater than ourselves. And America as a nation is founded on that very premise. And yes, our greatest imperfections, have we fallen short of those ideals? Of course, ad nauseum, the left will hit us with that. That's almost our best evidence that we have ideals at all. Our worst hypocrisies are our best evidence that we had ideals in the first place. Because if we're fallen human beings rather than gods and we do aspire to ideals, then that means we're going to fall short of them. But we're founded on the pursuit of those ideals. So yes, I have a civic nationalist view that's very different than the economic nationalist view, which adopts a different vision of American identity. And I think that's the deeper normative question underlying this entire debate, that I'm grateful for thoughtful friends right on the right who at least are willing to be intellectual proponents of an alternative view. I respect that because then we can at least engage and have this conversation rather than kind of sweeping it under the rug where it's really been percolating otherwise. Well, is it, I mean, is it really worth respecting? I think back to Ann Coulter's interview with you, uh, which I thought was really interesting, or perhaps it was on your podcast, yeah. though, right? Less, it was your interview with her. about it, I would admit, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, absolutely, I agree with that. Uh, but it was interesting because at least the vision of Americanness that you're outlining, there was a really telling exchange between you and her lost identity as very core to Americanness and how Jews and Catholics and pretty much anybody with non-white skin, uh, aside from Jews and Catholics, you know, have not historically been considered Americans and that their allegiance, who who is their allegiance really to? And you counter very beautifully, I think at one point that, okay, well, but you have a lot of seventh generation descendants from the wasps who live in, you know, Bushwick, I'm paraphrasing here, but who live in Bushwick and hate America and don't vote for anything that Ann Coulter would recognize as patriotism. You know, they balk at the American flag. In fact, maybe they burn the American flag in their sort of pro Hamas college campus protests, right? And yet you have immigrants, recent newcomers to this country, people who've been here for five years or the children of immigrants who have a much stronger idea of uh, and pride in their Americanness, a sense that this, um, you know, it's by the grace of God that they were able to come here uh, and it's no accident and it's not something to ever take for granted. And so you have one group of people taking it entirely for granted. And those are the people that Ann Coulter and many in the America First movement describe as the true Americans. And then you have a whole other group of people, some of many of whom came here legally, who are saying, no, I don't, I don't take this for granted. Being American is, you know, profoundly significant to me and I want to continue this, you know, to keep this dream alive. How do you reconcile the fact that there's 
that culture view, which is you know highly incoherent uh, on the America First side. Well, look, I think that part. And I said this, Dan, directly, you know, to her face, not you know face to face, but like <laughs> yeah. this, right? It was a great exchange. I, I thought it was really good. She was course. actually just being reactive to es by espousing a view she otherwise wouldn't have espoused if the current circumstances hadn't been what they are. And I think that's true for many people, even on the right, who adopt that type of, you could call it nativist or whatever you want, outlook. I don't think they would adopt that view if we actually had had proper policies to protect against illegal immigration over the last few years. I think their attitudes towards what the legal immigration regime should look like would be very different. But she and was so, saying these types of yeah. things five years ago. I mean, I, I maybe I mean I, I can't speak for Anne, and I'm not here to defend yeah. her. I don't. I, I just have a different worldview than her. But I believe yeah. in talking to people who differ in their opinions from mine, which is why I ended up having that conversation with her. But what I do believe is, I'll say for my part, I'm not going to speak for anybody else. For my part, I reject the blood and soil vision of American identity as the main source of American identity. I think American identity is grounded in civic ideals that. That's what Thomas Jefferson would say if he were alive today, and he's not. So I feel a responsibility to say it instead, because maybe nobody else is right now <laughs> in the same way. And that's a good litmus test to say that, you know, what would Thomas Jefferson say about X? And I think that for a lot of our, a lot of people in our own movement, we got to be careful not to say things that actually are completely flout and fly in the face of the U.S. Constitution with respect to, you know, you could think about identity based on religion. You could think about identity based on you know, blood and soil, genetic lineage, that's not who we are as Americans. Who we are as Americans was enshrined in two founding documents, the best operating manual known to human history, that's the U.S. Constitution, and the best mission statement that was in the Declaration of Independence. And the idea, can human beings rally to create a nation or national identity around that? Yes, that's exactly what the American Revolution was fought for. And I think that I don't want to make the same mistake as the left, denying that idealism right? Denying the possibility of that civic identity. Much of the woke left for years has rejected the possibility of that idealism. And I don't want to see that same avatar on the right saying that, oh, no, 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 that's too abstract. That's too, that's too highfalutin idealism. It's got to be grounded in something else real. I don't think the right answer to the left-wing nanny state is the right-wing nanny state. I don't think the right answer to identity politics is more identity politics. And so I think we have to ask ourselves, look ourselves in the mirror and ask ourselves who we really are. I think it's one of the risks in this upcoming election, even in the 100 days we have left. If we just get in the habit of defining our own views as a reactionary response to the other side, I think we're done. In fact, I think there's real risk that, you know, even in a practical sense, we could face electoral challenges in November. On the other hand, if we offer an actual coherent vision of who we are and what we stand for grounded in first principles, this should be a landslide election and victory. And one thing I will say is the Donald Trump I've gotten to know, and I think that one of the things that makes him the unambiguous, I mean, he won the Republican primary by such wide margins, I think it might be the widest margins that somebody's won a party nomination in history. There's a lot of reasons for that. But one of the reasons is I think that he does meld together a lot of these, a lot of these intuitions, but I would hate for your audience to miss the fact, because I've seen it firsthand, how many of those include hardcore libertarian in intuitions baked in there, right? Are you going to agree with 100% of what he says? No. But I think that defecting from the Republican consensus on something like the TikTok ban or taking an interest in the risks of a central bank digital currency and taking that on or committing to dismantle an entire government bureauc bureaucracy, that many on the right with the Department of Education will say, oh, no, we need to subsidize two-year college programs or vocational education. No, that's the wrong answer. The right answer is shut the darn thing down in the first place, which is something Trump is committed to do. That, I think, is um, the big risk where, you know, I've gone to NatCon. I go to hardcore nationalist audiences and preach what is a pro-national liberty direction. Well, I'm talking, as I understand it, at least to mostly a libertarian leaning audience here. Let me sort of let me sort of I don't believe in just telling audiences what they want to hear. I believe in saying what needs to be said to a particular audience is that speaking in some ways as one myself, I was known as a libertarian rapper in college, <laughs> cast my first vote for a libertarian. I spoke at the libertarian convention this year. I think one of the mistakes on the, in, in the modern libertarian movement is also asking the question of what do you actually want to achieve, right? Do we want to be intellectuals in some sort of corner with writing books and, and hosting podcasts and in an echo chamber offering commentary. Oh, it's fired. No, just kidding. Well, I, I, I host a podcast too, so I'm kind of <laughs> including myself, and I've written books too, right? I've written, I've 
I got my fourth book in three years coming out <laughs> later this year. But I'm I'm thinking about this in a self reflective sense. Like that's 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 a worthy mission. But you're not yeah. pretending to change. You're in not a meaningful the man in the arena, the right? You're run. off in some intellectual effect sphere. Right. Or, or do you actually care about actualizing some portion of the changes you see in the world in a lasting way? And if it's the latter, then unambiguously, I think the right answer remains to vote for Donald Trump this year, right? I mean, right now it looks like it's Kamala Harris is your alternative, who has an ideological vision that's a very different one. Take your pick because it's going to be one of those two people. If it's not Kamala, it's going to be someone else they put up instead of Kamala. But that's, I think, the, the pragmatism that doesn't deny your idealism. I'm not one of these people that believes that you show up at the 50-yard line, hold hands, sing Kumbaya, and pretend like you agree on things you don't. But I'm one of the people who does believe that the way we're going to unite this country is at once, first, standing uncompromisingly for the ideals of our founding. But number two is actualize as many of them as we can. And then we roll this debate forward. The debate we're having here is not ripe in the next hundred days. It's just not. And I say this as somebody who is deeply interested in the topics we've just discussed in the last half hour. It's not ripe right now. That's not the number one question on the list or on the minds of most voters in the country is what this future daylight is in the direction of the America First movement. It's very important to me. I'm glad you guys care enough to engage with it now, too. That's not ripe right now. And so I can both care about this for the next eight years, for the next 10 years, 12 years, while also recognizing that over the next four months, we've got work to do. And part of that work is... Maybe we're not going to cut 75% of federal bureaucrats. That's what I ran on. But I think we have a chance, a historic chance to cut a good number of them along with the federal regulations that have been unconstitutionally held by the Supreme Court. And our single best chance of doing that is putting Donald Trump in the office, which is my case and ask for libertarians to consider voting for him. Vivek, um, we could go for much longer going deep oh. into all of these issues, uh, trade and immigration. Hopefully we will be able to continue that conversation with you another time, but I know you've got to run now. So I want to leave you with the last question of the show, which is in the spirit of the show, what is a question that you think more people should be asking? Hmm. In the spirit of this conversation, I'll give you. There's a lot. There's a lot that could. There's a lot of answers I could give you. What does it mean to be an American? I think that's a, that's an open question. That the more we talk about that, the more likely we are to succeed as a country. And if we're being really honest, I think a lot of people on the left and the right have some haziness in their answer to that question. What does it mean to be an American? What does it mean to be a citizen of this nation? I'll give you one answer to consider. What it means to be an American in the year 2024 is that we still believe in the ideals of 1776. Not some lineage, not some king, not some monarch, not just not only some land, not some sort of religion, not anything. It's that we believe in the ideals enshrined in the Declaration of Independence. That's my answer, what it means to be an American. But if you have a different answer, great, let's talk about it. That's the question to ask. Vivek Ramaswamy, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to Just Asking Questions. These conversations appear on Reason's YouTube channel and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed every Thursday. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and please rate and review the show.